Bienvenue à cette dernière session. Nous avons deux conférences plénières. La première par Yann Zanen et la deuxième par Michael Tanter. And I will switch to English because the first talk will be in English. So it's Professor Yann Zanen. He's a theorist, expert on strongly correlated electrons, and he will tell us about string theory in condensed matter physics. He comes from Leiden and the Lawrence Institute. So please. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's kind of top order. It's A hot. B, I have to give a talk. There's like three colloquia, one hour pressed in 40 minutes. And the chairman said he will be very tough. So I apologize. I will be very superficial uh, for the experts. And I will have to wish like a madman. So what is it? It's about string theory. And I guess all of you are kind of familiar with string theory. That's the pursuit of ultimate reductionism in physics. I had to cook up a beautiful equation explaining everything, including space and time, whatever. However, things evolve, and when you now go to a string theory floor, you hear people talk about things like heavy fermion subconductors and high TC uh, subconductors and so forth. Um, and it really came out of the logic of string theory itself, and that's the story I want to get across uh, today. And you see here uh, in the gallery of faces, so basically you see here people that are heavily involved in right now, mostly employed by places like MIT and Harvard, etc. Fashionable out there. And they're all three series, except for the three last phases, that they're super successful in the films and myself, and we are really people with a career in complex metaphysics that got lured into paying attention to it basically because it's so interesting for us. And I like to say that I myself flown in for occasions like this by the three series because I'm kind of this authentic witness. Right? I don't have a big invested interest in it. It's just the best thing I know to do right now. It's a lot of fun. I hope to seduce you to uh, be with me. The claim, after all, is outrageous, when you see the first time. So it's about uh, these uh, not so interesting looking pieces of black stuff. They are high TC superconducts that are made out of copper and oxygen and so forth. In these systems, you uh, realize a very strange form of electron matter that's iconized by this uh, uh, of science that I will explain in a moment. And there's been an enormous progress in experimental uh, well, physics in modes of experimentation. There are now these fantastic machines that give us much more insight in what's going on there, but the more we learn, the more puzzled we got. And then the sincere came and said, oh, not a big deal. Imagine that a mysterious electrical stuff lives on the outside of an infinitely large universe. And it lives in a completely boring space-time. And now the claim is that in order to understand this stuff, what you have to do is go into that universe of which the uh, electron stuff is on the outside, travel to the middle of that universe and will find the black hole. And the black hole is indicated here, the event horizon is the red grid, and then you sit in your spaceship, you look out of the window of your spaceship and you see these kind of light effects. What are they? They're the light of a blue star, accompanied by a little brown and uh, green star that gets deflected by the warped space-time of that black hole. And now the claim of the thing series is we have some magic mathematics that translates this kind of physics in a very indirect but a very precise way into the physics of the highly collective quantum mechanical electron stuff. This is the take-home message. And now I have to explain this to you why this is credible, why it makes sense. Now it surely has to do with a sort of long tradition that things we learn in the labs of experimental uh, and that's matter physics have bearing on the most fundamental questions in physics. And the point of case is the Higgs mechanism you might know that the Higgs mechanism might uh, uh, create more turbo recently at uh, CERN is actually literally stolen from superconductivity. Right? So, uh, it's basically like you translate the theory of superconductivity into a uh, physical context and bang, you get a Higgs mechanism. Right, and that's this morale that also what's called fundamental physics is now understood to be deep emergent physics. You have strange bleepers at the Planck scale, now what it does, what it is. You pack them together, they start to do collective things, and eventually we get to see the most collective of behaviors, where we see things like the standard model. And therefore, it is well studied 
the simple degrees of freedom of condensed matter physics. Subcollectivity has been iconic in uh, condensed matter all along. Uh, so I was discovered in Leiden in 1911, and then it took until 1957 for the gentleman Barney Cook Schiefer to explain how subcollectivity works in simple superconductors. And I guess you know the story. You start out with a gas of non interacting uh, electrons. You hit it with phonons. The phonons create an, an uh, effective attractive interaction between the electrons. And by magic, these electrons are uh, forced to marry. They form pairs of electrons. And at the moment that these pairs form, they are bosons. They both condense, and you have <coughs> superconductivity in things like aluminum. And this seems all to be settled until a long time ago, again in 1996, the high-TC superconducts were discovered by Müller and Pecknors in these very complicated looking copper oxides. Now the big signal was uh, basically this plot. Now you see a long, long struggle to increase the TC and uh, that sort of leveled out at around 24 Kelvin or something and then these couplets came and shot up to temperatures as high as 160 Kelvin. When this happened, it triggered a big uh, uh, effort in physics, perhaps the biggest of all uh, uh, hypes of human physics. And, and there was a very, very intense research program started that is still going on until the present day. So, in the meantime, it generalized. In the first place, we now know that there are many other uh, chemical uh, uh, compounds where this kind of physics is happening. There's this whole family of things without going into it. But more importantly, the experimental condensed matter physicists profited much like astronomers of the improved technological possibilities. Okay, in astronomy you have also space technology, but astronomy revolutionized in the first place because of computers. And basically the same thing happened in uh, condensed matter physics. All kinds of new machines came online that uh, could work because of computers. And they allowed us to look much deeper into the world of these collective electron systems that was possible before. So there's kind of thermal spectroscopy, there is the neutral scattering, the called atoms play a very important role in this business, and there's also photomission. And since I need later a bit of photomission, let me explain a tiny bit about how this works. So imagine you have your simple band structure like non interacting electron systems or electron system energy bands, and you fill them up using the powder principle. And now photomission is missing also the photoelectric effect uh, 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 understood by Einstein. So you show light on your uh, metal and outcome flying electrons and you measure very carefully the energy and momentum of the outgoing electron. You know what it is from the incoming light and thereby you can figure out the probability to get an electron out of the solid at a given energy and momentum. And now you can plot that. So the uh, horizontal axis is the momentum. The wave factor of the electron, the vertical axis is energy. Here's the firm energy, you look, you look at occupied states, and you get to see these pictures of the band structure. Now, the big uh, story out here is that when I was a young graduate student, the typical resolution in photomission was measured in tens of electron volts, thousands of Kelvin. In the meantime, um, the technique has improved to a resolution which is kind of sub Kelvin both the momentum and energy, and thereby you can do very, very high precision experiments on that highly collective life of these electrons that establishes itself in a precise manner only at the lowest temperatures and energies. Right, so there's been a 10,000 fold uh, improvement in the experimental technique. Okay, so the experimentalists went out uh, firing the heavy guns on high TC supports, etc., and we learned a lot but actually, at present, the situation is more mysterious than ever. We are more lost and serious than we were in 1996. So what's the story? The subconductivity is boring. Again, you find out that the subconductivity is done by these pairs of electrons. However, everything else you find out in these systems is very strange. So one thing we know is, Instead of having that simple Fermi gas metal, which is a point of departure of the BCS theory, you're dealing in the couplets with something that looks on a microscopic scale more like a traffic jam. So these electrons occur at a high density, they strongly, strongly repel each other, and the effect of it is that you basically, the, the world out there looks more 
like what you find in busy uh, freeways also in Marseille, I bet, right? Where all these electrons are in the way when they try to move. The difference is you have now to quantize this. The electrons have to stay in motion because of the, uh, zero point motion of mechanics, not because people want to get home. And the fact of this is that all kinds of strange states of matter that we like to call quantum matter are realized. To go into a bit more detail, this is the iconic phase diagram of the high DC superconductors. So the vertical axis is temperature, the horizontal axis is hold open, read it as we start out. This a situation where the traffic jam is complete, this thing moves, that's called a mock insulator. You don't, and it means you take away electrons, you get kind of a stop and go traffic. And especially when the, the, the traffic is very dense, you find all kinds of strange orders that we didn't know about before uh, like the light was discovered. There are the stripes, there are the cur loop currents, and so forth. I have no time to go into it. You go further and further and further, and at some point, it seems that normalcy returns. The, the uh, electron traffic starts to flow smoothly, and it seems to turn into that old fashioned Fermi liquid, that gas of electrons. Now, the real cool part of it is actually what happens in the middle. Right? So, superconductivity goes down when there's too much of this uh, uh, traffic jam stuff going on the pseudo gap regime. It goes down when you are in this Fermi liquid regime. When you're right in the middle, you get your maximal TCs, you heat your system out of the superconductor and you get into this machine called a stainless metal. And the stainless metal is the thing that is really obsessive for theories. The reason is that this stainless metal behaves in extremely simple ways. And the uh, symbol of it is the linear resistivity. So when you have a normal metal, you can basically think that the class of particles of fermi liquid a little uh, balls that are getting you out in the pinball machine. But then the pinball machine is very temperature dependent. And the fact of it is that the resistivity is an interesting function of temperature. The striking fact in the cooperate is that the resistivity is just a straight line. It's a linear resistivity. As simple as things come. Another trouble is that you have to explain why it's so simple. In order to have very simple behaviors, you need very strong principles that protect the simplicity. And after all these years, we have not that much clue. We have a bit of a clue. The bit of a clue is also associated with the relation to the black holes I turn to in a little moment. Oops. Now to explain that little thing that we understand, I would like to use the metaphorical tool of a piece of vegetable called Romanesco, it's kind of a cauliflower. Let's take a little piece of it, zoom in, magnify it, and it still looks like a vegetable. Take again a little piece of it, magnify it looks like this. Again, take a little piece of it, magnify it by factor 10 looks like this. Well, if this is no what this is, this is a scale invariant cauliflower. Or in other words, a fractal cauliflower, uh, or you might even call it a, 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 a critical cauliflower in the sense that it looks the same regardless of what scale you observe it. And now imagine that this is made out of a bit more interesting matter than biological matter. That is, we reach the microscopic scale and quantum physics kicks in. So we have a strongly quantized body flower. And now we do again our uh, scale transformation, now zooming out, and we insist that everything stays the same. So when we uh, amplify things, H bar continues to look the same. We do it again and again, and we end up at the microscopic scale. And we find out that this stuff is quantum behaving the same way on the microscopic scale as it did on a microscopic scale. This is a state that's called the quantum critical state of matter. And in a way, it's the most quantum physical state you can imagine at microscopic distances. We know, and I will get back to it when I talk about black holes, that this kind of principle is at work in the space metals. And it's not only true in the Cooper, it's also true in every fermions, but uh, perhaps even a better case. And right now there are strong indications that the same quantum criticalities underneath the so called activity of the new ion superconductors. For those who are really interested in electrical physics, um, the real oddity is that this kind of quantum criticality is of a kind that we cannot explain on the basis of established quantum field theory. The established quantum field theory basically boils down to you do a parasitical mapping of your quantum system onto a statistical physics system, you may get a critical system. 
But then we find, in the case of the cuprates, that something goes badly wrong because we find that the chronic criticality is local. It only acts out along the time direction in a purely temporal scale of variance, while in space directions it seems to be very boring, this seems to happen. Uh, in the jargon of bit per theory, it means that your dynamical critical exponent goes to infinite, and we have really no clue how to understand that on basis of established uh, uh, theoretical methods. For those who are, who are really into it, this is talking in a very interesting way with a development that started in college metaphysics called dynamical mean field theory. You might know about Antoine George with our college de France. He is one of these guys who really made this working. Where these people find in a very different way actually the same motif of this local dynamics, right? That the color fluctuations only act out in a temporal sense. And here the black holes will shed some very strange lights on this affair. Again, for the uh, insiders, the problem is really that we are dealing with a, a system of strongly interacting electrons, and they are fermions occurring at a finite density. And then this horrible problem hits, which is called a fermion sign problem, which means that the, the mapping to statistical physics gets lost, and we have actually no machinery in conventional uh, uh, quantum field theory in this working. Right? And now we are dealing with a situation that we need to do critical theory in the absence of statistical physics, and that reduces the uh, local quantum criticality. And this brings me to the black holes, because here the black holes work miracles. What the heck has all this stuff to do with black holes? It all started with string theory, and all of you have an image of it. It started a long time ago, in the 1960s, with the idea that there's a standard model with all these different uh, particles. It's a zoo, it's kind of ugly. Let's now imagine that instead of these things being particles, they're little tiny strings, they vibrate in different ways, and every different way you see it vibrates means a different particle. So it is a nice unifying principle, it seems. Even better, when you start to fall around with it, it's very mathematical. And before you know it, you're doing all the time general relativity in computation. Somehow, general relativity is part of this. String theory evolved, and there was this big um, thing happening in the mid 90s called the second string evolution, where the perspective actually completely changed. It changed from this ultimate reductionism to actually something that's more like statistical physics. So the words are. Uh, in 1995, there were all these dualities discovered between these different three theories that were identified, and they made sort of a web of dualities spanning around the in the middle called MC. All you need to remember here is duality. The greatest result of this Ecclesiastes revolution happened in 1997 by a person called Paul Lassina, who figured out that under very specific circumstances, Actually, general relativity and quantum field theory that seems to be so different and even seems to be deep enemies of each other could be actually the same thing deep inside. It's just depending how you view your system, whether you think it's general relativity or it's quantum field theory. But again, a duality. And that's really the working horse of these new applications of mass metaphysics. But, so it's all about duality. This thing is also called now holographic duality. What's duality? The simplest version, the oldest version, is yin and yang of the Taoists in China, saying that the opposites like man and woman and cold and hot and cat and dog uh, belong together, form together a harmonious whole. Now in physics, duality became much more precise. The duality, all of you know, is a particle wave duality of quantum mechanics, where you're dealing with a quantum mechanical degree of freedom, you know that you can view it as a particle, you can view it as a wave, and the way they are opposites by the Fourier transformation. But all of you understand that to understand quantum mechanics, you have to cope with both sides at the same time. This got greatly generalized in the 1940s by my predecessor, Marty Kamas, and the French uh, hero, uh, Wanye. In Kamas, Wanye, or a strong, weak duality, and this was the birth of the uh, field theoretical duality. Statistical physics field theory is all the same deal. So you take the simplest thing you can imagine, which is the icing model, like this everybody knows the icing model, these little up and down spins that like each other, and uh, therefore when you cool it down, all spins that in the same direction, you heat it up and get a high temperature phase, 
which is very strongly fluctuating and so forth. We call it strongly coupled, so you look at all these randomized spin configurations. But now comes the one you realize that actually you can, you can uh, enumerate all that disorder in terms of the objects carrying the disorder which are in to the, the domain walls. And now you can view that uh, turbulent uh, high temperature state actually as a condensate, an ordered state of these domain walls. And they actually demonstrated that there is a precise mapping of these domain wall condensates again on the icing ball, which is now dual. So it's a very tranquil world where again the icing spins are all very nice and ordered, but they are not the dual icing spins. And the trick is it's often much more easy to compute things in this uh, tranquil, uh, weakly coupled world than it is in the strongly coupled world. And that is basically the secret of nearly all non perturbative techniques in quantum field theory. This the ADS CFT correspondence is called marriage with gravity in a very, very unexpected way, right? So gravity is really like this Einstein equation telling that space and time is a very dynamical thing, and it's actually the same thing as the matter and energy in the space time as the force, it makes it like black holes. Now how can it be? The clue is really an other old idea, the idea of Hawking radiation, right? So I guess everyone knows the story as well. So you take the space-time of a simple, old-fashioned structural black hole, but now you realize that the space-time is the vacuum of a quantum field theory lit up by all these virtual uh, quantum fluctuations, these possibles and electrons popping out of the sky and disappearing in no time again. And then the workings of the black hole is, it has this event horizon, and there's a causality structure that rips apart the coherence of the vacuum, and the fact of it is that the black hole starts to behave like a material object. It behaves like a light bulb. And now, when, you, when the space time thing starts to behave like a material object, you can ask the question how do I count the degrees of freedom? And there you went into this uh, remarkable uh, uh, observation that actually the entropy of the black hole, the number of degrees of freedom of the black hole, is of scaling with the volume, which is the case for us in this room, is actually scaling with the area of the event horizon. So it seems that in gravity, but you really need one extra space dimension to accommodate the uh, principles of uh, matter physics. That's called the holographic principle. And now it comes. The ADS CFT correspondence is basically an example of what we saying. We have an extremely strongly coupled quantum field theory world, which is like a holographic plate, which is interference phases. We shine through the laser light, and we get a three dimensional image in one higher dimension. In the same series version, it's like this three dimensional object turns now into a real gravitational but weakly coupled world. You need to know one more thing, and that is um, that it only works under certain specific conditions. One specific condition is that the space time in the bulk, as it's called, needs to have a so called anthropocentric -anthropo geometry. This is just a world with a negative cosmology of constant inside hyperbolic space. Now you look at the picture of Asher, which is also hyperbolic space, and you see immediately that although the space is infinitely large, it still has an outside. And that you need because on this outside the field theory lives. Now you observe that there's this extra holographic dimension, which is the radial direction from the outside to the inside of this space time. And very, very beautiful because it turns out that this direction has identity in the field theory of the scaling direction. It marries the randomization group into this whole uh, strong weak duality business. So when you travel from the outside of ADS to the inside, in the field theory you go, you flow from the sea where it is two at high energy by integrating out high energy degrees of freedom to the theory at low energy. Now to make, to make this really work, also need is um, that the field theory, when the dog is completely at the center, the field theory is automatically a conformal field theory, which is the mathematical word for quantum criticality. And here, the first connection was established by some time ago now. We were all the time seeing quantum criticality in the lab. These guys were departing from it in order to make their mass working. Right, so the bottom line is, we have an entropy city space time that's describing generic quantum critical or conformal field series. Now this will be it because it turns out that only near the boundary or at very high energies in the quantum field theory you need 
uh, precisely on criticality and enter to sitter, but you have to have the right to fall around in the deep interior of the bulk. When you fall around there, you describe the highly collective emergence physics in the field CUE realized at very large distances, the deep emergency. The mechanic is now that Einstein's theory that you do in the bulk is an extremely restrictive, opinionated theory, only allows for very, very few solutions. And the strategy is you just see what Einstein's theory allows you to do in the deep interior, you pull it through the dictionary and you find out all kinds of theories described in collective waves of matter. This turned into a huge success story dealing with finite temperature matter. So already early on it was figured out that all of thermodynamics is reproduced in uh, the thermodynamics of field theory in terms of gravitational physics. The greatest triumph is perhaps that you can also address the hydrodynamics of the field theory that is, you put your field theory at the consistent at the finite temperature, you go to long times, and everything turns uh, classical, when there's no rating of translational symmetry, it has to form a liquid, that liquid has to be described by hydrodynamics, by now for Stokes, and yes, the way you're, you're, you're supposed to do this in ads is, to describe finite temperature in the field theory, you have to plug an old-fashioned structural black hole slammed in the middle of ADS. Then you have to look at little space-time quakes near the horizon of that, of that black hole, and that describes the hydrodynamical behavior of the fluid. And there's this beautiful thing, you have these three very different theories, general relativity, quantum field theory, and hydrodynamics, and actually the correspondence glues it together. You can literally translate the GR space-time uh, quake business into precisely the structure of Navier-Stokes equations in the bounding field theory. The only specialty is that you depart from a short distance physics that is quantum critical, it is not going on in water, and it has a very interesting consequence because it influences the numbers in hydrodynamics. And perhaps the most important number in hydrodynamics is the viscosity. And it was early on realized that um, you get kind of universal answers for the viscosity dealing with in a microscopic physics that's quantum critical, which is the famous minimal uh, viscosity that's saying the ratio of viscosity to entropy density is a number of order one times Planck's constant divided by Boltzmann constant. This was shortly thereafter, in 2005, actually discovered to be the case in the Quartenon plasma made in Brookhaven by the heavy, heavy iron collider people. It was a very, very big surprise. It was conventional QCD, they very, very different in a way, opposite answers. It are also seen in the unitary Fermi gases made by the cold atom physicist. But the point is that we, in condensed matter physics, knew about this already in the early 90s. We were basically with such a uh, who figured this out. But the bottom line is, when you're dealing with quantum critical states of matter, they're in a way the, the, the most effective heating elements you can imagine. They're characterized by an entropy producing power which is actually bounded by Planck's constants. So all that really matters is that there's a time scale, which is the energy relaxation time, that says uh, the time it takes to convert work into entropy, and that time is determined by Planck's constant. So Planck's constant has the dimension of energy times second. You divide it by KBT, dimension of energy, and you get the time scale of seconds. Now, I think you sure you find out that this explains minimal, minimal viscosity. But the case can also be made very precisely that in the experimental systems, so the linear resistivity is actually governed precisely by this time scale, numerically. So we know that this Planckian dissipation is at work in good ways and is perhaps the best evidence for the quantum criticality of the strange metal state. This was the situation basically in 2007 when contact was established between condensed matter and the string theory community. And then we started to talk to each other and we started to fire condensed matter questions to the string theorists and that gave rise to an avalanche of very surprising and very, very interesting results. Again, in this gravitational philosophy, you want to now describe matter at a finite density. I already uh, emphasized that, and it has to be uh, a periodic matter. You look in the ads CFT handbook, and you ask what do you have to do in the talk to describe the matter, and it's very simple. You have to plug in an electric monopole charge smack in the middle of ADS, 
and that forces the kind of potential in the boundary theory that we can find out if we find a density method. Now, the simplest way to accommodate this charge in the gravitational world is by making a charged black hole, a Reisner Nordstrom black hole. And this Reisner Nordstrom black hole has been really the revelation. You dualize it, and you ask what it means for the field theory, and you get stuff out that really looks like the space metals we see in the Cooper superconductors. And even better than that, you find out that this uh, uh, stage metal is, is very unstable and when you lower temperature it also turns into states of matter that we better understand. States of matter like the Fermi liquid, the high TC superconductor and say all the pseudocap waters like stripes and so forth, it all drops out. And it all has very nice natural gravitational encodings. Right? So the, the state of the art is that all states of matter that are understood by humanity can now be uh, understood in terms of the mathematics of general relativity. There are a couple of rogue players that we don't understand in an explicit field theoretical language, uh, but they look much like what we see in experiment. Whether this is really the case or not, we are not sure yet. So, this really got going in 2009. I'm very proud to be the co-author of the first paper that appeared in Science based on string theory. Well, most of the work was done by my colleagues at Leiden, Kurtz, Holland, and Mikhail Kubovich. And then the model was let's just do that famous photoemission experiment, but now using general relativity to compute the photoemission spectrum, we got out things that really looked very kosher. So we can uh, fit the around parameters, we start out these things that really look like good Fermi liquids. You have these very, very sharp fast particles, which is functional momentum and energy. Here's the Fermi energy. But then you can tune things around, and you can get into a regime that is class apart, get completely bizarre, that they fall apart, and things have nothing to do with Fermi liquids. Right? So we just started to interrogate the Fermi liquid side of this stuff, and it looks pretty good. Basically, at the same time, our uh, friends in uh, MIT, or you and John McGreevy, got the same result, so it's a light and MIT thermals they're called. But a year later in Hong and, and John came up with a beautiful paper in science really explaining what was going on. And now it comes. It's all about these Rice and Nordstrom black holes, and they are gravitationally famous and very beautiful objects. So imagine, uh, yeah, the first thing you have to know is that you can make these black holes extremal which means that all the energy is stored in electromagnetic fields. And that means that they are actually zero temperature, Hawking temperature black holes. So they describe zero temperature states of matter. Now, if you're a spaceship and you approach the horizon of uh, such a horizon or some black hole, and something very, very remarkable occurs in the geometry. You look in spatial directions near the horizon, it looks like this room. Nothing interest is going on. It's completely flat. But then you look in the plane spent by the radial direction and time, and you find out that there's an emergent ADS2 geometry. This means that you have an emergent, purely temporal scaling variance popping up in the, in, in the field theory because the geometry in the bulk is describing the scaling variance in the field theory. So we get for free this behavior of purely temporal or local quantum criticality that I already emphasized uh, a couple of minutes ago, as being the central enigma in these strange methods. Whether this is really precisely the same way that it happens in experimental systems is a long and complicated discussion. The bottom line is the jury is, not, uh, uh, is still out yet, but there are good reasons to be hopeful. There's a very rapid development going on at the moment, making it all more realistic. This is not yet all of it. Because this Reisner Nordstrom black hole can become extremal, then zero temperature, but it still has a horizon area. And the horizon area is encoding for the entropy in the field theory. In other words, this object describes a state of matter characterized by zero temperature entropy. And the way this is in the 19th century, we know that this is very unstable. But the good news is that the gravitational side is of the same opinion. This led to a sort of a parallel development in relativity that was very inspiring for the relativists, it was believed that black holes could not have hair, meaning that black holes have to behave like elementary particles, as a mass and energy and a momentum, that kind of stuff, but they cannot have more properties. 
It was discovered because of these more or less minor questions that this cannot be quite the case in Antony City. Because to describe stable states of matter, you need like holes with hair. And these kind of states were rapidly uh, uh, discovered uh, in the last uh, three years or so. An example which is not the latest, this is still in the construction of completely settled, but I find particularly appealing to my comments by the mind, is this question of can we actually make a firmer liquid, holographically, and can we let this firmer liquid emerge from a non firmer liquid set of matter? I'm really there. Um, now, the bottom line is that you do your gravitational exercise, you start out with your horizontal nice, nice black hole, and now you can fill parameters. And at some point you find out that this black hole wants to uncollapse into a star. And the star is now made out of charged fermions, it's called an electron star. Now you track what happens in the field theory when you do this operation on the gravitational side. Here are photo emission spectra, so you tune your momentum to k the fermion momentum. And here are the occupied and unoccupied states as function of energy. And here are deep in the strange metal, you don't see anything, there's no firmness, whatever. And then there's this point where the star starts to, the black hole starts to collapse into a star, and pop, you find a beautiful passive particle popping up right at the firm energy. And when you approach it, you find out that there's sort of a shadow of a firm surface that starts to build up as a relaxational firm surface, as a firm surface that exists for a little time and then disappears away again. The first time that humanity has seen how a firm liquid can get bored out of a non firm liquid. The Harry stuff really started out with holographic superconductivity in uh, 2008 by uh, first by Kupser and then Hartmann and Hertzog Horowitz. You look in the string theory uh, books and you find out that you have to actually also implement a priori a Higgs field in the dog. Then you tune parameters and you find out that when you approach that extremely rational black hole, that black, that black hole wants to spontaneously acquire an atmosphere of that uh, Higgs hair, of that Higgs field, and that is then the black hole hair, you look in the field theoretical tool and pop what you have is something that's quite like a PCA superconductor. The onset of that hair encodes for a pair amplitude uh, that plays spontaneous symmetry in, 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 in the boundary field theory, gives you an idea how it works. So you vary temperature in the field theory, you find out that plop, here the uh, transition to a superconductor uh, happens. Uh, in a moment, where the heck am I? Yeah. And then you just see the, the thermal evolution of the super, superconducting order parameter, which is very similar as to BCS. And this is a picture of how this, 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 this atmosphere behaves when you go from the boundary from ADS to the deep interior. You see the sort of peaks up the inner horizon. It looks in many regards like a BCS superconductor, but in subtle ways it's very, very different. And that's in principle measurable. And we have put together in Leiden an experiment where you can in principle measure in a very short way the difference between a BCS superconductor and a holographic superconductor. This involves in fact a machine based on a relatively simple Joseph junction. However, for material technical reasons, for material science reasons, it's very difficult to build. So when you are in the Joseph Junction business, and you're interested in these kind of stuff, please have a look at the paper, see whether you can help out. This is only the tip of the iceberg. There is a very rapid, remarkable development going on. It, 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 it continues to be not boring. Uh, right now there's a lot of work going on incorporating the effects of translational symmetry breaking, right? So electrons and solids feel an ionic lattice, and a whole lot of interest in this all popping out. A very interesting relations established with quantum information series, such metals are densely long range entangled uh, state of matter. There's very interesting stuff going on with non equilibrium physics. You can uh, put everything on the time axis and study in a very controlled way non equilibrium in uh, uh, field theories, but I'm running out of time. I expect my chairman to shut up uh, me, so I'm basically getting towards the end. The take home message is this cartoon. So, when you're curious, even when you're an astrophysicist, how the life looks in the vicinity of a black hole, it might be that in a couple of years from now we cannot quite offer you the trip, but at least we can offer you 
a hologram of that black hole as measured by experimentalists in Thomas metaphysics. When you want to read a bit more, we are working on a book dealing with these matters. And there's a rough draft available uh, on this web page. And it's supposed to be used as friendly, readable for non thing series. This is what I wanted to tell you. Thank you for your attention. So thanks a lot for this beautiful lecture. I guess our questions. Who dares? Thanks. Thanks for, like that, uh, for this talk. Uh, are there some, some um, uh, predictions from this uh, ADF DFT correspondence uh, we can probe uh, experimentally in, this, uh, in any other kind of matter? I mean, not necessarily for ITT's faculty of But uh, this, is, this is how I failed to come up with really smoking gun predictions. I think that nobody expects that right? you go out in the lab and you see it. Now, I would like to argue that uh, the best one on the market right now is our officially called pair sustainability device, where, yeah, it's sort of a long story, but I'm trying to explain it, but when you would be able, I mean, in the bottom line, what you're supposed to do is measure the dynamical pair sustainability in a normal state of this metal, and then you're supposed to see immediately that local quantitality popping up. There's not a energy a superconductor, and there's a real, very sharp difference which you can get out of the data by just doing scanning analysis. To make the gadget is very, very hard to for sake. Quite a number of other uh, developments going on right now, um, especially related to the incorporating a pain stick motif, right? If you have an ionic uh, lattice uh, floating around. Um, in a couple of weeks from now, there will be a paper in Nature uh, Physics. Uh, accompanied by a user views by me, which is alluding to this uh, long-standing problem in high to see group rates that these things are so two-dimensional. When you just look at the band structure, there should be quite three-dimensional metals, as the research have been out for a long time, and that you don't understand, it kind of self-organizes into a real two-dimensional metal. And they also find rather specific predictions in the way that are perhaps a bit easier to check. And the kind of more as an official marching order is to precisely produce these experiments, it's still under construction, these two goes But guys have a good press is keep in touch with it because they're coming and then we really need people in the lab checking it. Other questions? You showed this mean field phase transition for superconductivity. Why is it mean field? Is there a deep reason yeah, yeah, or is yeah, it yeah, always yeah. mean field? Good eyes, good eyes. No, that's, that's, that's an excellent question. There's one headache in the uh, ADCFT, and that is that there is a restriction on the boundary field theory, the kind of series you can handle, which is called a large n limit. So what you actually need in order to have full mathematical control is a field theory that's like QCD, where you have now n different uh, colors of quarks, where you have now to take that limit n to infinite. Only then you get the, the, the mapping onto weakly coupled gravity where you can play the black hole games. Now the big mystery is that say you do now the dynamics, and large n is not important. Right? It always works with just the, the, the generic structure of your own wave of theory. When you're dealing with thermodynamics, large n has an influence because large n is the greatest force promoting mean field uh, behavior. It's better than large dimensions. Right? So it's a bit of an artifact that you find such a beautiful mean field behavior. It's not really a big deal because we know how to restore the fluctuations. No. Yeah. Uh, can, can holography be applied to classical general relativity? Say it again. So can, can the holographic principle be applied to classical general relativity? Yes, yeah, so there's this other side, right? And it was sort of the, the original excitement of ADS-CFT. Um, right, so the CCs were more interested initially into understanding quantum space-time in terms of the field theoretical hologram. Uh, it's again related to this large N thing, so they make N smaller. You get more and more strongly quantized 
gravity in the bulk. Right, and so it tantalized me because then you think, okay, small hand field theories are not that hard, and we just learned from the holograms how the space time itself looks like. And this was a nightmare. It didn't get anywhere really in all these years, right? And that is the reason that the perspective now changed to focusing on the matter side, right? Using uh, uh, the relativity that we know how to, how to do. However, very recently, there's an intriguing development. Um, there's now a flow to marry it with quantum information. And there are now these stories that yeah, I like to call it, there's this old credo by John Wheeler, it's from bits. Right? They basically think that all we know is about information processing, this sort of matrix moving type of image of John Wheeler. When you make that it's from quantum bits, all kinds of things seem to work. Right, so there's also there in progress, it's like that this material side sort of coupling back, feeding back on the gravity side, and there seems to be again motion starting there. Now the ghost picture is that because the quantum gravity bit was so frustrating, the thing series turned their eyes towards the material side and there it started to work. Okay, good question. So maybe we stop here and right. thank you very much.